Okay, cool. So again, your task, a fairly simple one, your ranking, who you would most want to be, all the way down to who you would least want to be. And again, you know, you can put a one or a two or a three, whatever the corresponding number is, next to the letter of the person you would most want to be, all the way down to who you would least want to be. If the panel wants to participate on their own, there's some paper right. Uh, um, It says trading places round one. A, 19-year-old Latin McDonald's employee. B, 30-year-old man who recently immigrated to the U.S. from Pakistan. C, Just give folks about 30 more seconds. 45-year-old Caucasian CEO would you most Fortune 500 want to be company. Or trade places with? D, Muslim real estate agent that is fluent in Arabic. Want to be or e, trade Asian places store with. owner. F, pregnant African-American woman with three children. G, Latin Again, no model. right or wrong answer. H, 21-year-old Native American drummer. Which would you most like to be? Any questions before I go to slide two? Everybody good? Just give me a thumb. Just give me a thumb. Everybody's good? Okay, great. We're going to go to the second round. We're going to go to the second round, so just go to your second column. Your task here remains exactly the same. So I'm asking you to rank who you would most want to be all the way down to who you would least want to be. Um, this time, however, I'm giving you a little bit more information about each person. So these are the same eight persons. Your task is just to rank them from who you would most want to be to who you would least want to be. You know, if you can change your answers if you like. That's, that's absolutely fine um, and up to you. Who would you least want to be? All the way up to who you would most want to be. So least to most, so the changes are that A, the 19-year-old Latin McDonald's employee now attends Howard University and is majoring in business management. B, the 30-year-old immigrant from Pakistan now drives for Uber on weekends. The 45-year-old Caucasian CEO of a Fortune 500 company is divorced and has a daughter who lives in a boarding school. The Muslim real estate agent is now a Caucasian male. Um, the Asian store owner um, had $3 million in sales last year. The African-American pregnant woman has a PhD in neuroscience and owns a multi-million dollar home. The Latin model is a well-known proponent of holistic medicine. The 21-year-old Native American drummer, he wants to launch a music program to, te to teach youth on his reservation. I know people go at different speeds, so let me just check in. Anybody anybody not good? Is everybody on screen good? Give me a couple a couple more minutes. I'll, I'll give folks give folks six more seconds. Thank you, sir. Again, there are no right or wrong answers here, no right or wrong answers here. Okay, we're going to have one last round, one final round. Again, your task is exactly the same. Who would you most want to be, all the way down to who you would least want to be? Again, I'm giving you just a little bit more information about these, these same individuals. Just a little bit more information about these same individuals. Your task is exactly the same. Who would you 
most want to be, who would you least want to be? So now the 19-year-old Latin McDonald's employee, her family owns five McDonald's franchises. The 30-year-old man who immigrated, who works for Uber on the weekend, is a full-time employee at an international tech company and is saving to buy his first home. The 45-year-old CEO, Caucasian, divorced, recently published a tell-all book about her battle with depression. The real estate agent is a highly sought after motivational speaker who makes $10,000 per speech. The Asian store owner with 3 million in sales served an 18 month sentence for fraud and money laundering. The pregnant African American woman with three children who's a PhD, her husband was killed in battle as a Navy SEAL. The Latin model uh, who is a proponent of holistic Medicine is graduating from Just the Yale School of Medicine. People kind of go at different speeds. I would say those of you who are finished, those of you who are finished. And, and the drummer graduated from up. the Juilliard School of Music. Those of you who music. are finished, you can kind of take a look at your, your rankings for me across your three, your three columns or your three rounds. Just see if there are any trends. Are there any patterns? Are there people who started high and went low? People who started low and went high? Um, and just think through as well. You know what criteria you might have used to rank persons. What criteria you might have used to rank persons as you went across all three rounds. Right. So giving people about well, 30 more seconds to wrap up their ranking, and also to consider people who started low and went high, people who started high and went low, and what criteria you might have used across your three rounds. Great, and so as people wrap that up, uh, that up, what we want to do now is have a, a, a brief conversation about this. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can see one another a little bit better. Um, and we're going to have a conversation about, about the activity, um, about, about the experience, and, and ultimately about empathy. So I'll start with a um, you know, straightforward question. As we do this, you do not have to share how you rank person if you would like to. That is absolutely up to you. That is welcome, but you do not have to share how you would have ranked Putin. So my question to the group on camera is, was this an easy exercise? Why or why not? Was this an easy exercise? Why or why not? Anyone can chime in. I'll chime in. It was not an easy exercise to start, but became an easy exercise as you gave us more information and understanding. Okay. So I hear you saying, hey, round one was maybe a little bit difficult, but round three was a lot easier than round one. Is that correct? Thank you, Nicole. Any, anybody else? I'm here from two more persons. Go ahead, Kate. I would agree with the progression with Nicole that it, it was really difficult at the onset, got easier. Though I will say in round three, the complexities of someone's identity pose a different type of challenge for me. Got it. Got it. So for you, yes, it did become easier in some respects, but the, what I hear you calling complexity or maybe intersectionality um, was, it, was, it, was a little bit of a challenge. Yeah, here from two more persons. Andrew, Andrew, I found it to get a little bit more challenging. Even though there was more information in round one, it was almost like the blink decision, you know, boom, boom, boom. Because I didn't know a lot. I, I had very little to go on. And then with the intersectionality of the layers, I went into deeper thought and it was a harder choice. Got it. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, Chief Dariga, I saw you wanted to say something. Sure, good evening, Andrew. Pardon my tardiness. Uh, the the last one was the most difficult uh, just because it had so many different uh, as sandy indicated layers there were the goods and the bads but the focusing on some of the family issues uh, certainly impacted some of the decisions i was making there excellent excellent yeah so so I, you know I'm, I'm hearing that hey you know this this exercise was a little bit different for different people so for some of us it, it was a little bit easier on the front end where we kind of had that top top line bit of information for some it became a little bit easier for some 
complexities in round three um, may have posed a challenge. And for some, you know, it was actually the other way around, a little bit easier in round one, um, a little more difficult by round three. Um, did anybody's choice of, of, you know, number one remain the same for all the rounds? Why or why not? And again, go ahead, Dan, you can jump in, and Kent, you can jump in next. Um, you don't have to, but you can if you would like to. Did, did, did your choice remain the same? Uh, why or why not? Go ahead, Diane. Yeah, my choice remained the same, and I actually, I'm just going to add to that first question. I generally find this this difficult for me because for me it forces me to, like, acknowledge my bias. So um, uh, my number one remained the same because she was a black woman with children, and that's what I am, and that's what I know. And that's what I love. I was changing, and I was like, oh, no, but I know that. I can do that. That's who I'm going to be. So, um, you, you know, my the uh, African-American woman with three children, even when she lost her husband, she was number one at the top and number one at the, at the last round, too. Thank you, Diane. I appreciate that. Go ahead, Kenta. Show your hand. And you can go next. Yeah, yeah so I, I would agree with my first choice was the same. It was a black woman because that's who I am and that's what I know. And, and very similarly, that stayed the same. And even when it got to the last round, I was thinking, but I have a support system that will help and sustain me. And so that that stood out to me from my own experience. I think thinking, and I want to go back to the first question as well a little bit, thinking about the overall activity, the first round I thought about What might it be like for important to me? And so that's one of the shifts that I noticed as we went from round to round, that it was more of an external kind of, huh, what would it be like to have that experience? And then more of, okay, what would it be like for me to have that experience? So that was a shift yeah. that yeah. I noticed. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, Chief. Go ahead. Go ahead. Chief, sorry. Yeah, no, no problem. Andrew, thank you. Uh, I think uh, mine stayed the same as well. I, I was drawn to, to the Native American drummer. Uh, just uh, quite frankly, by the interest in in the uh, description of the person, and each each round um, drew me more and more closer to uh, that person in, in the um, in the experience. So that's that's why I stayed with that one. Yeah, excellent. You know, I think one of the things that that, that we kind of talk about all the time, you know, is that even though this exercise or activity may have been more difficult for us in the beginning. Um, a lot of the time, what we do do is make assessments of people based on the things that we see, right? So some of those snap judgments, I think, um, is what Sandy referred to as. We do make snap judgments about people as we navigate our world, right? So whether it's, you know, in a, you know, a social interaction or a professional interaction, um, we are making assessments of people all the time. So I think that's, that's one of the takeaways. I was, I was pretty, you know, uh, curious that you all raised already that, you know, Diane and Kenta, um, yourself as well, Assistant Chief Arco, that you know there were some people who seemed a little more familiar um, and that was actually a question I had so you know for others were there folks on here in terms of these eight persons that seemed more familiar to you and did they stay higher up maybe let me hear from some folks I haven't heard from yet so a harder if you don't mind then I'll chime in anyway. Absolutely yeah I think that you know for me, my, my person stayed the same, and again, because I was able to identify um, as an African-American female. But then the other ones fluctuated based on not so much what the race was of the other person or how I could identify with another person, but more so about what internal or external aspirations I have for myself. So now I can place myself into a position of a store owner. I can place myself into a position of a real estate um, agent. And so then that became my thought process. The first thought process was who do I identify with most? The second process was how do I identify in terms of what my capabilities are and what I can do. Um, and so then that kind of altered how I went through the rest of the activity was, you know, the African-American female stayed consistent. I can make it do what it does no matter what, because um, that's what I'm used to doing. Um, but everything else, now I have to look at how do I see myself fitting into these different scenarios. Got it. Thank you. I appreciate it, Vin. Yeah, in a similar way, I think from my standpoint, um, the CEO, uh, white individual jumped out first, but then it shifted for me. 
in, in a sense that I was focused more on, you start to see exposure to the, the individual's journey and, and have a be deeper appreciation for those experiences, right? Um, I'm drawn to individuals who overcome challenges. Uh, that's, that's valuable to me. Um, you almost try to put yourself in their shoes to try to understand their life mission in a sense. And the difficult part that I started finding was there's not a lot of information, so you can't you can't go too in depth there. But at the same time, you can start to kind of appreciate where an individual's journey is, and uh, and you value that, and that's that's where I came out on. So I did shift. Uh, I did not stay consistent across the board. Excellent, excellent. So what I hear you're saying, you know, is that hey, you know, it's a little bit easier for us to empathize, to connect to take the perspective of those who might be similar to us, you know, for, for whatever reason, whether it is um, how they might be demographically um, or whether it be some of those values and so on um, that Vin shared there. Um, the other, I think, critical point that's coming out is that the more we know about people, the more conversations we have with them, the more dialogue we have, the more interaction we have, the better we are able to empathize because then we get a sense of, of what lies beneath the surface, so, so to speak. Um, I, I guess, you know, as we kind of try to, to wrap things up and transition, just, just two more questions. So, so one is, how, how would you all define empathy, you know, in your own professions, your own lives? I know we have folks here who work in a, a wide range of sports and in law enforcement. Um, how would you define empathy and, and maybe, you know, why it might be applicable to, to the job that you do? So how would you define empathy? Why is it applicable to the, to the job that you do? Anyone can, can jump in. Andrew, it's been, um, it's, 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 it's a question in my mind, it, it, it's empathy in my mind is the ability to, to, to sit in someone else's shoes and understand where they're coming from. What, what I realized though, that's a bit of a process and what you were just explaining is really critical to understand where the individual's paths are and their experiences, that's really critical. What we see is, and I think college, high school, professional sports teams see it, there's a lot of different ways to get success, right? It's not just one path. And understanding that from a diverse standpoint brings it. If you way, what I found in my experience is that diversity of thought brings a natural empathy. By direct and, and that empathy allows us to, to 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 work together better, right? Which ultimately is drives towards success. I mean, that's what we've seen in, in, in experiences working with great teams. Uh, and so, although it's critical from the standpoint of understanding one individual to, to, to sit in other, sh in other shoes, in a sense, um, it's really the open- he, he unplugged accidentally. We have to, to reboot. To we want to get to. Technical. I may, I may have, a, have a couple more views. How are you defining it? Go ahead, and uh, Ada, you can chime in. And, and sorry, Admiral, can you, you go after? Yeah, so I was just going to add really quickly to what said um, in terms of the ability to step into another person's shoes. Coming up for me was the willing to do so as well, right? Because we can have the ability to do a number of things. And so I think for me, adding to understand someone else's humanity is how I would encapsulate kind of empathy. And by trade, I'm a psychologist. That is what I do and what I should That's how it relates to the work that I do. If I can add on to, to what Kenza has said, um, and maybe this is coming from my previous life as a mental health counselor as well, um, but it also is the ability not just to understand and cognitively be able to place yourself in someone else's shoes, but it's also emotionally, can you connect? Um, can you feel what someone else is feeling? Can your heart open up to someone else and what they're going through? But then also on a compassionate level, does that then drive me to want to do something? Does that then drive me to want to assist or support or, um, or be there in a way that I didn't think I could be there before? So it's sort of like this building up, you know, we can all cognitively understand somebody's up, somebody, someone else's situation, but can we open our heart enough to really step in there and feel what they're feeling and, and be able to help them get through it? Beautiful. Thank you. Admiral Kibben? 
No, I think Ahada captured it. I, my, for me, there's a nuance between sympathy and empathy. And when we talk about kind of understanding, that's more sympathy that to say, OK, I get it. Cognitively, it's all there. But empathy really is to open your heart and, and examine what's, what string, string is being strummed in this interaction and to be able to identify that and say, OK, now I get I understand. I've been there. My heart is strummed, and uh, but but empathy is is a harder thing to do because, as Ahada very keenly said, it really requires some self work, some self exposure to kind of get into your gizzard and say, yeah. And not only do I cognitively get it, but I I completely have been there. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, yeah, Andrew, I just, I just love everything that everyone has that already said about the willingness and the open heart uh, with empathy. And it's also, there's this vulnerability, this, this ability to allow yourself to go there and to, you know, to, to listen and, and put yourself in that space and time. And you know, just kind of just shifting a little bit of, uh, of gears here is this, this profession of law enforcement. I've been doing this for 32 years now and 32 years when I started uh, empathy, empathy vulnerability, vulnerability, heart, heart. Those, those were not words that I was brought up with in this profession. This department, this department has done a great job to work towards that, uh, towards that through a number of reforms and a number of uh, reports that have been written as far as moving from warrior to guardian and having that shift in ability. We've done a lot of great things. We still have a lot of work to do, but this is a, a great conversation um, talking about empathy in, in the law enforcement because a lot of people don't necessarily associate that that's the work uh, at hand or the first uh, reaction or the first start for law enforcement. But I've seen a great change in law enforcement, not only in my own organization, but many others, understanding that we can be so much better and have so much um, more connectivity and connection with our community and those people that we serve uh, with that put forward, empathy. Great, yeah, well said. You know, that, that actually speaks to the final question I had, which is, you know, why is empathy important in these conversations? You know, between law enforcement and the community. I think you, you spoke a, a lot to that. Um, I, I'll let folks give one final word, but before I do that, I just wanted to kind of share this graphic which kind of speaks to what some of what Admiral Kibben was saying. You know, I really do think that as we think about, about it, we lost them. The, we can do um, to build stronger bridges, to build a stronger connection between law enforcement and our communities. I think, you know, the question is around, you know, are we truly able to step into someone's shoes, not just from a, a cognitive standpoint, but also to be able to do so um, from a, an, an emotional standpoint um, as well. Um, just in the interest of time, um, I'm just going to pass it over to Diane, see if you have any final words. Diane, really want to thank all the panelists for joining us. I don't know if anybody else has any final words, but I'll, I'll let Diane say a few, few thoughts before we, we transition. Thank you, uh, uh, Andrew. I must, I must say to everyone, I think I'm the luckiest person in the room. This gets to be my job. You know, I get to lead this team and learn and grow. And so I am just privileged. I also want to give a early uh, happy uh, or thank you for your service um, and acknowledgement of Veterans Day. I am so honored to be on this call with so many people who have served our country in this way. And so I don't want to miss that opportunity. So I just, I just thank you all. Um, even as, you know, what John said, us not being political, the ability for us to speak our minds and share and have our stances, I am aware that it comes from people serving our country. And so I am deeply, deeply grateful to you. Um, I would be remiss. I'm not saying he's my favorite, but I am saying General George Casey is my board member. So I would be remiss not in giving him uh, so much appreciation for a lifetime and career of service uh, at this time. I want to thank everybody for joining. I'm excited for the next part of this. Um, I just want to reiterate, RISE's, our mission is to educate and empower. 
And so we hope that you all had a great experience, but we hope that you are more educated and more empowered at this moment um, for us to begin to address things uh, like racism, oppression, and more to unite us. Uh, as a country. And so I hope this is this first part of tonight's event has done that for you. And I hope you guys will continue to partner with us to do those things in the future. Thanks, Diane. Thanks to everyone again for joining us, um, taking time out of your busy schedule. John, I'll pass it back over to you. Um, the, the rest of the panelists, you're, you're free to, to stay on. I know some of you have other commitments, but you are free to stay on and observe yeah, we, the rest of the. We want everyone to stay on if, if, if you can. Um, so we're going to join now our, our in-person panel and incorporate you're that muted. into the just John, you're muted. Incorporate them into the um, discussion. I think you might be on mute, John. John, you're muted. Okay, how about now? Echo, echo. Okay. So we're going to join our in-person panel now. I'd like to first introduce our host, uh, Sheriff Alex Villanueva. This is the uh, Youth Athletic League run by the LA Sheriff's Departments for the youth in the Compton area. And we're very pleased that uh, we were able to use the facility today. And as we talk about empathy, what do you want the community and the people online to know about the job that the Sheriff's Department is doing to improve our community? Well, yesterday I had a meeting with uh, the City Refuge, uh, Bishop Jones, Elder uh, Joe Paul and uh, council members from the city of Compton. And I was joined there by Captain Latanya Clark from the Compton Station. She's there in the back. And we had a very, very healthy discussion about our different perspectives and how do we work together to keep the community safer. And a lot of it was very uh, wisely pointed out with by uh, Bishop Jones was the issue about communication. There was a lot of things we were doing very positively that um, from my capacity, we assume, okay, we're feeding everything out publicly, the media covers it. However, it doesn't filter all the way down to where a councilman or councilwoman from Compton can tell her residents, oh yeah, they're doing this or that. And they not realize that while wow, we're getting it. The work is being done, okay. however, people yeah. don't realize the work is being done. And that happens, and that happens everywhere. everywhere. So a lot of recall so a lot of recall in place. Are in place. So Change overnight, but Change everything is putting place of foundation in place. And then we bear the fruit. Like the body worn like camera, body -worn thing, camera that was 20 months struggle. Month struggle. It's now in place, it's now, now bear the fruit. It's, it's all about transparency. We're just to improve the issue of trust between the community, the community and, law enforcement. and law enforcement. And law enforcement. Yeah. A lot of circumstances, a lot of, lot of events, events, are, lot of events that are happening that make that it, uh, the, trust it, uh, the trust can be great. And uh, suspicions and, uh, are very easy in very today's easy social media, media age where there's so many different, so many different conspiracies there. People run off, people leave, off, leave off, whatever they see. But when you get down to the basic facts, everyone wants to be able to Everyone wants to be able to provide for the family. Everyone wants to have a greater future. No matter who you are, we all agree on those things. How do we get there? And that's... We're going to get started. We're going to get started. Rome was not built in one day. Um, we're going to do a quick kind of lightning round with the panel here. But I call on you. Uh, my question to you is, as you look at the city of Los Angeles and the community and the relationship between the police and the community, is the glass half full or is the glass half empty? And I'm just going to call on each person and just uh, please just uh, give us your answer. And we're going to start off with... Um, Dave um, Roberts, Dave world Robert, champion world manager, champion if you can manager, unmute yourself and uh, uh, yourself put on your camera from Dave, Dave, and Dave, let us know as the manager of the Dodgers, the Dodgers, Dodgers are a very Dodgers important very member of the Los Angeles community Los Angeles and, and one of the pillars of our community. Of our community. Um, how do you see it? Glass um, half full, glass, glass half, half empty? Glass half empty. Um, I think, uh, I say it's half, half full. Um, I think that, um, you know, there's a lot in this past year, things have been brought to everyone's attention and rightfully so, which kind of uh, makes it a little bit more muddied as far as half full, half empty. But I think that overall, I think half full. Chief Villanueva, half full, half empty. Half full, half empty. I'm going to agree with, I'm gonna agree the, with manager the, the manager there. The manager there, yeah. It's always half full. Dex Elliott. Dex Elliott. Half full or half, half empty? Half full or half empty. Half empty. Half empty. Jaretta. Half full, half empty. Half full, half empty. Half full. Pastor Cedric. Half full or half empty. Uh, I would say 
Uh, half empty. Half empty. Uh, Deputy Chief Arcos, Deputy half, Chief full, Arcos or half, half full or half empty? Half full or half empty? Half full. Bishop Mendez, Bishop half full Mendes, or half, half empty? Half full or half empty? Depending on the Half full or half empty? Half full or half empty? Half full or half empty? All right. Ron All right. Hernandez. Ron Hernandez. Half full or half, half empty? Half full or half empty? Do we have you from the... Yeah, you from the Sorry, I'm, uh, I, I, I'm Jim Wheeler from ALADS. Uh, I'm taking the place of Ron Hernandez, and I believe the class is half full, for sure. And that was Jim? And that was Jim? Yes. Yes. Okay, sorry. Wheeler. Wheeler. All right, thank you. All right, thank Nicole. you. Nicole. Nicole. Nicole Whiteman. Nicole Whiteman. Roger Foundation. Roger is the glass half full or half, half empty? Full or half empty? Do we still have Nicole, or did, have Nicole or did she drop off? Half full. Half full. Half full. Half full. Half full. Half full. Uh, Susan, Hudson, uh, Susan Hudson, are you with us? Hudson, are you with us? If you're with us, if, if you can unmute and you can turn your camera on, do you, you see the view see half the view, full or half, half empty? Or half empty. Say, half, say half full, John. Half full. Half full. So we got a mixed bag. We got a mixed bag. Which is kind of good. That's the reason good. why That's this is event is important. event is important. So now, so now as we look to how do we bridge that gap using veteran and athlete mantra. So athletes and veterans have a lot in common. Discipline, hard work, accountability, teamwork. Teamwork. So I'm going to throw a question to you, Dave Roberts. Dave Roberts. As the manager of the world champion Los Angeles Dodgers, you're a team of diverse individuals. You have to bring them together in order to form a cohesive bond and have everybody on the same page. How do you get that done? How do you get that done? Um, yeah, I don't think that's a, it's certainly a, it's not a simple answer. I think for me, it's uh, the, the people that I'm around um, I, I think it, the crux of it is, or the most important thing, is that you have to acknowledge each person as an individual, um, kind of understanding what makes them tick, uh, showing them how much you care and showing interest, and then kind of trying to keep everybody on the same page as far as accomplishing the same thing. But I think for me, growing up, it was kind of uh, do as you're told, but I think now it's kind of changed as far as leading and trying to, uh, you know, get to players individually. It's, it's, it's a lot more difficult, but I think that they want it. They still need it. Uh, so I think it's the individuality thing and the consistency of communication. Excellent. Thank you. So now I'm going to throw it to the police chief, to uh, Assistant Chief Arcos and Sheriff of Illinois, where you guys go one at a time. As you listen to Dave Roberts talk about how to bring people together using communication, what do you want the community to know about what your department is doing to create more accountability and camaraderie within your department and within the rank and file? <laughs> Okay, Deputy Arcos, okay, Deputy, Arcos, Deputy Chief Arcos, did you get to hear the question? I think I heard the question, and I think my, my response again to, um, to you as you spoke to, uh, to, to Coach Roberts is that this department is very diverse. It's very reflective of the city that we serve. And diversity uh, really demands uh, and requires inclusion. In our department, it's very important that our men and women are included in all things that we do and say, that we, that we have a, a good communication. Uh, gap that I mean a communication uh, loop that works uh, both ways that we hear from our men and women and that we respond to those, those needs and then from that we really then start to state clear objectives clear expectations and then build this work of, of the team to serve uh, our communities in, in the best possible way I'm gonna I'm going to point to a simple thing I did earlier on when I started the job. Is it in the past, in the past a career serving a career serving a community and sitter to the dead and career? In fact, I had a sheriff tell me I was a young sergeant. You've got to get out of control. You've got to get out of control. You've got to get out of control. You want to value, 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 you
placing our values placing our values back into the community. Okay. okay. As we did our exercise did our on half exercise full, on half empty, we had some answers on the half empty side. So I'm going to go to the community because that's where we heard it from. So we're going to start off with Pastor Cedric and then Dex and then Bishop Mendez. As we look at the glass half empty, what is it? What is it? What is it that you want law enforcement to know? Why you think the glass is half empty? Well, I think the glass is still half empty because we still have we still have people that are still dying. Uh, and we can police in a way that is systemically inaccurate. So, and so looking at the glass half empty and dealing with the ideology of empathy, empathy is all about proximity. If 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 I'm dealing with a situation and I'm not close to that situation, then I can be very numb and impersonal to that situation. And so we look, and so at, we look at policing in this city as, as a pastor of a church. Of course, I hear it firsthand because it, it comes from a level of, of natural suspicion. And so everybody is on guard and nobody is in a, in a, in a place of diffusing uh, themselves or at least operating Somebody is, somebody is willing to relinquish some level of control. And, and, and when, you look at that when you look at that question, I think it can get better, as the bishop has said. I just don't, I just don't know if where we are right now is in a good space say to say that it has gotten better. Because, because until we can say that, that when we look at communities that are predominantly black, that, um, that the police in those communities look like those who like they're policing, um, or, or we can say that they are being policed from a level of natural of natural uh, respect and not being killed. Then that's when we can say, that, we can say that the glass is shit on it. Till that happens, I still feel I still like feel like it's happening. Okay, Dex. Okay, Dex. I said, I I believe the city of Greenwood City is half full and half full. Based on a lot of things, people are dying. 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 The reason they shouldn't be dying. And this is something that's been going on my entire life. When I was a kid, I didn't look at police officers as the bad guys. When I was a kid, we played cops and robbers. I wanted to be a police officer. I wanted to capture the bad guys. To capture the bad guys. Put them in there. To arrest them. To arrest them. To arrest them. But when I became an adult, I started looking at the police officers as the bad guys. I started looking at the police officers as the bad guys. I started looking at the police officers as the bad guys. I started looking at the police officers as the bad guys. That person. My mom, my mom was, a police was a police officer. My stepdad was a police officer. I was around police officers my entire life. But my personal experience was not that a pleasant experience. I think the main problem I see is that it's a lack of leadership. I don't see police officers being hired based on integrity and leadership. Based on what I see as a I see a lot of guys up there with the chisel attitude. attitude and Cockiness and bullying behavior. I don't understand. I can tell you four incidents I've had this year alone that was completely unacceptable by police officers that being around. One just happened week, and I'm a law abiding citizen. So to me, until we change this whole bullying and until we take accountability and say, look, the police set the tone for everyone else. We, we as, a, as a community, follow what you guys get. If you so if you say that things have four, you can say something completely different. There's a major disconnect. So at some point, so at some point someone's not listening. But then we look at the, look at the evidence, evidence and people are dying at a long rate. Yeah, yeah, people are all national. We're going to get to that in a second. One last thing I'll say. Police officers can be graphic with grand opportunities for those like heroes to be heroes. To be, to be those people I want to be when I was a kid. But I think they're missing it because they're not listening and they're not serving the people. Serving the people that bully me. Okay. Mr. Okay. Mendez. Mr. Mendez. I see that 
uh, too, too many incidents where the police is not on up to the state, and, and, and that creates a problem, that creates a problem for the other 99 police officers that are good officers. That are good officers. And so it, and so it, it, it is important that, that, that we have clarity, uh, clarity on, a on a lot of matters because, because sometimes, sometimes uh, things are spread under the table and they pretend and like, they pretend like it didn't happen or it's not happening. And, and you know we have an issue like 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 Gary Compton, like Gary Compton uh, uh, Harvard, uh, Harvard, uh, Harvard so we did all these gangs that uh, the community uh, talks about gangs in Trevor Station Sheriff Station and gangs you know within other departments you know that's that's very upsetting and that's uh, you know, it hurts what you're trying to do and the other people are doing with it. So it's important, so it's important that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that those issues within the police department, within the sheriff's department, within the hybrid patrol, because, you know, sometimes we forget about the hybrid patrol uh, harassing our, our, our community members. And they're, not, and they're not here, and they should be here at the table. Do we have them here? They didn't accept. Well, there's a reason they didn't accept. Because, because you know, they stop our our, our community members, give out tickets, and when the, when the, when the uh, community residents go to court, usually they, they sign with, with police officers. So that's why I say that it depends on the issue uh, that the black is half empty. And, and I know that LAPD and the Sheriff's Department are trying to um, help and, uh, I know so help the community, but we, we need to be honest with, with the community. Uh, we can't just uh, continue to take uh, uh, things under the table because we, we're not stupid. You know, we, we are very intelligent people that will not think that the police department and the sheriff's department and the highway patrol and all the other little municipalities that they're little things. Okay, so you bring up some good points. The community okay, so that say the glass point. is half the empty. And so now uh, some some words so that came now, up, uh, systematic, some, some that ideology, came up. systematic, bullying. ideology, bullying. So we have uh, one of the great things about so sports have, and uh, veterans is we do a lot with analytics. And so I'd like to throw it to the and police so union. I'd like to throw a lot of people point the finger at you saying that you guys resist change or resist improvements. And so, uh, talk a little bit about data so analytics and how the police union uses data analytics, analytics to try to um, report try to the behavior uh, or instances of, of uh, instances why people, of, would, think uh, so would, would think the glass is half empty. So, let's start with you, Doretta. And first of all, Dexter? Yes, okay. Um, I, I hear you. Um, I, I feel you're asking me. And um, you say the glass is half empty. You say the glass is half empty. We say we have full. The reason why I say, I wouldn't say we have full. The reason why I say it's half full is because you have an opportunity like this and what's happening right now to sit down and hear from you, to really listen, to feel the passion. Um, as far as the police community, you can build a lot of data. And I think. And the reason why I became a police officer was I was robbed when I was 18 years old. And my ex was killed. And I didn't want uh, anyone to have to go to that. Like, you know what? I'm going to be a police officer because I'm going to protect that. So, um, you know, I work in the community. I work in the community. I work in the community for a long time. And I've been telling you that murder stopped the right. We have to be better. There are 24% of the community that stopped the right. Okay? From last year, there are 20 there are 28 percent. And then you have gang homicides of 24 percent. So this about those law abiding citizens like yourself that are in the community that need the police, that want to live in an environment that's safe, take a walk in a kid let school. We have to let the protector serve from our police department. And that's what we expect officers to do. So when they're not doing that, the community feels that they're being bullied or or they're not uh, getting we fairly. If we all have to say, we have the police. And I think that's why we're here right and now. I think that's why we're here right now. To open up the dialogue, to bridge the gap between the police and community. And we're, we're with that 100%. But these murders, we have to stop. We have kids dying. We had 10 children under 10 years old that were killed in the last three months. We have to do better. We have to do better. It takes a village to 
Um, Jim, um, if you're Jim, with us, if you're with us, talk a little bit about the, bit about the, association, the association of association of deputy sheriffs, deputy sheriffs, and how you guys and how you guys work, work. and how can you address the concerns of the half empty glass of the half empty glass community members? Yes, can you, yes. Can, you, can you hear yeah. me now? Yeah, sir, sir, can you hear me? Can you yes. Hear me? yes. We can hear you. Okay, okay. Hear you. there might be a little delay, but I'll, I'll, speak, I'll, I'll speak now. Um, um, I, too I too have worked in the inner city, city uh, for LA County, um, um, our, our sheriff's, sheriff's department. department. Uh, uh, you know, gangs, gangs are, are a, a, a tremendous problem. problem. We don't seem to address, seem to address that. that. It, it, it seems it to be, you know, I, you know, I, I, I'm gonna just give you a, a personal, a personal uh, a story. A story. I, I worked at Compton for about three years, back in, back in uh, 2004 to 2007. Uh, during, that uh, during that time there, uh, we had to put a gang murder task force together. The murder rate was 72 murders for that year. We, we thought that was completely unacceptable. Uh, as the sheriff's, sheriff's department, department, we put a team, we put a team together some of some very good policemen, and and, and, and we, went out, we went out to protect the public. The, 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 the crimes, crimes I remember, I remember going, going to five shootings in a day. Five shootings. Five shootings. I, remember I remember watching two or three, two or three people die in front of me, talking to, talking to me, the last, the last person I talked, I talked to. to. Uh, it, was it was very violent, violent down there back and then. The sheriff's department did take it over. Uh, we, we, took we took the murder rate, and it was, and our, it was our task force. We took, that we took that murder rate from 72 to 29 in a year. In a year. And, 29 and 29 is not acceptable, but I, I, understand, I understand the public's outcry down, down there in, in, in those cities. Uh, I've, worked I've worked there a majority of my life. I've worked four years in the Palmdale area. And, you know, there's a big diversity up there also. Uh, you know, police are not called to a positive thing. We're not called to, hey, thank you, sir, to come over. We're called, we're called to deal with problems and problems that arise with mental illness, drugs, gang activity. And a lot of other things. Um, and if you want to look at the analytics, I think 99% of us are doing our job and we're doing our jobs great. Of course, you're going to have bad apples here and there, and those seem to make the headlines. But it's very rare that we get to see um, deputy sheriffs put in a positive light when it's just they cherry pick those incidents that happen and until they're adjudicated and until they're investigated, you know, why the onus is always put on the deputy sheriff. So, but my, my feeling is I'm always positive. I always think that the glass is half full. I think, I think can, we can we do better? Of course we can do better. Are we going to do better? We always do better. I came on this department 31 years ago, and let me tell you, uh, things have changed tremendously in this department, and they continue. It just happens to be a slow process, and you know what? We don't get to deal with ideal situations all the time. And it's especially in those violent, in those violent areas. areas, and they are, and they violent, are areas. violent areas. I've, and I've worked, I've worked ten years, ten years of my career areas. in those areas, and I've been on our SWAT team for the last twelve years, and I've seen even more violence. So, so oh, we, try we try to do the best we can, and, and you know, we we love the public, and I think the, and public, think the public generally loves us. And I, I, you know, unfortunately, there are some incidents, some tragedies, some things that shouldn't have happened. But that's just that's just like everything else in the world. You you can't call all of the priests pedophiles. You can't call teachers pedophiles. You can't lump everybody into one incident. And I think that's what we feel. We feel that we're under attack. However, we're there for the community. We always will be, no matter how bad it gets. And hopefully it's better. And that's okay. That's all I have to say. So 
So part of the great thing the about the Boys Project is that we use the, use the military mindset, military mindset, military mantra, and the ethos. And we have with us today with us several, today, um, several uh, leading, uh, leading military uh, veterans. Military veterans who, Solve difficult solve problems difficult in Iraq problems and Afghanistan, and I think there's some lessons learned here that we can help build that bridge between the community and the police department and how we look at the glass half full, half empty. We have with us today Sergeant Major Dave Clark of the United States Army. His job was to build the Afghan police department in Afghanistan to provide civil. Um, um, and use the different, use the different uh, tribal, uh, factions, tribal factions, all of which factions, hating each other, hating would each kill other, each other in the drop of a hat. And how, and how do you get those people, get people of diverse backgrounds to work together? Back to the question you asked Dave Roberts at the start. So, Sergeant Major, if you're with us, Dave Clark, are you there? Dave Clark, are you there? Thanks a lot, John, and thanks for having me join the town hall today with community leaders and police chiefs and senior leaders across the uh, nation. And I know with respect to time, just want to cover a couple of things. When I think about over uh, eight combat deployments between Iraq and Afghanistan and my last uh, deployment, I spent two and a half years in Afghanistan training the security forces in Afghanistan. And, and I looked at it in, in the leadership. We as a team looked at it, you know, how do we solve this problem? When we look at winning the hearts and minds of the people, and that's the social pressures when we look at a country. And each country has its challenges. In Afghanistan, when we look at the level of corruption, probably one of the highest levels of corruption in the world. When you look at that country, that piece of terrain compared to any other country uh, around the globe, and how do you get after that? How do you chip away at that each and every day? And that's how we approach it. We got to chip at that. Uh, each and every day. So the military pressures, uh, the diplomatic pressures. So it was a combination we had to work in and keep in balance. But I looked at it uh, with the leaders. So I looked at the leaders, the leaders that was in place, the leaders that were shaking civilians uh, down and how did them civilians, the Afghan people view their military uh, at that time. They didn't have a lot of trust in their military because a lot of unethical uh, things that was going on on a daily basis. So we, we, we put a real four court press on getting rid of a lot of the corrupt leaders and really, so we looked at their police, their officer academies, their police academies, their NCO academy, and how do we put a whole fresh look into that and bring instructors in there that really was more about the country, the future of their country, the, the future of their people and in their military. And once we start doing that, we noticed the change in that. And the people start having confidence. So when you look at across the country, okay, where are problem areas and where are areas that's doing real good? So the leadership where you had low crime, uh, uh, low challenges, uh, sharing best practices. So, so bringing them leaders in and doing leader forms and sharing best practices on the ground, effective leadership, good leadership, and then using examples where are bad leadership, where are pockets of just disruptors, and, and, and really shining the light. I always look at it as you got to put the spotlight on right a lot of times. So where are areas and pockets that are doing great? And, and put the spotlight on that and then zoom that out and, and have them share why are they affected? Why are they doing great? Why is the crime rate is so low in them areas? And when we flip that, that's when I seen the change in uh, uh, areas that was really bad, bad areas that was infested with uh, uh, terrorist networks that was controlling the people and controlling that piece of terrain. And when you zoom the spotlight and you start putting injecting good leaders in there to get after the uh, serious, serious complex uh, uh, problem. And, and, and that takes uh, leaders with passion that really truly care. And, and when the people see, I always use the approach, when people see commitment, they see leaders that's committed leaders that they can trust and leaders that they, they genuinely care 
that genuinely care. And, and then I look at our country and, and I look at what's going on in our country. Yes, we have some challenges, but I think for the most part, our, our, our security forces, our police forces, first responders are committed. For the most part, when we look at trust, yes, that's an area that's going to take some work because it just takes a couple of uh, bad apples to, to erode at the uh, trust. And then it takes, that's something that just don't happen overnight. And I think that's where patience uh, uh, come in at. I think that's where a little humility uh, uh, come into play. And then the emotional intelligence uh, 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 piece. And so with our attack, when we looked at their security forces, and, and, and that was day and night. So I traveled across the country on a continuous basis and took leaders out at night and seeing what's going out on in the communities, in their communities with their people at, at night. And when the people see that, well, commitment, things that Well, we froze up. Okay, well, we're going to go to Dex real quick. Oh, what had the uh, Officer Academy developing good leaders, and that goes back into the ethos, the ethos that, that, that they believe in, not necessarily what we believe in, but how do we share that and project that in their people doing the right thing and showing our level of commitment uh, uh, with the uh, mission. Uh, on the ground. But I think genuinely, because uh, uh, people got to see uh, uh, leaders that genuinely care about them. It's one thing to see them, but do you hear them? And that's something we stress with the leaders uh, across the security forces in, in, in Afghanistan. And hearts and minds, it takes time. It takes time. And I think about the war torn countries that they had to deal with in Afghanistan and Iraq. They've been at war for over 40 years. All right, so Dex, real quick, react. And uh, uh, every day, the trust back. And so I pause there for any questions. So thanks a lot, John. Thank, thank you, Sergeant Major. Thanks, thanks so Dex, Major. as we look at yeah, the community, we look at the community you're looking at the glass half empty, half empty, can you name or suggest you name a community or that you think it's going that well that can be well modeled, modeled after? Personally, no. Personally, no. Yeah. I think the standards, I think the standards that my mind is I, like I said, I think when you say the fucking trust, that's very, very extreme. I think that very extreme. I heard the first, the one officer, the one officer, he sounded like exactly what I was saying. A lot of the nights. Being a police officer, we all know it's very different. Very different. But it's a selfish job. And a leader is a selfish job. It's something to serve the people. To serve the people. To be actually going to a difficult path. We have to really, change the way really change, the way change, change the way what people want. wanted. We wanted to cheer police officers. We have police officers getting off time and time again, and, and there's no, there's no, you know, with, with immunity, the public we, 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 we get frustrated. And then you say, then you say, okay, okay, we're doing the best. Then you say, okay, we're doing the best we can. The problem is not what we see. That's not what we see. That's not what we okay. see. Um, sheriff. Sheriff. As we look at what uh, look Sergeant at Major what, was talking uh, about in terms of training and, and dealing training with the diverse, with the diverse um, uh, uncooperative, uncooperative uh, systems, uh, systems, is the onus for is accountability the onus on for the officers on or on the community? Um, and how can the Sheriff's Department the sheriff, um, um, lead the way um, there? Lead the way well, I can say the onus well, is the the accountability. Is accountability is because we're, because it's, we're it's always been it's it's always accountability, been about accountability, and accountability and we've worked at it for a long, long time. But police accountability is actually exactly a subject of the are we uh, respecting the rule of law? Are we respecting everyone's right, right, everyone's the right the liberty, the right to happiness that you mentioned? And I would put myself as a sheriff of a county, county. right for everyone to live. That's my starting point. I want everyone to survive. For everyone, everyone to live. Everyone, everyone to survive. I don't care who you are, everyone. where you come from. I don't care who you are, where you come from. Here, I want able to, to be able to talk. How can I achieve that? How can I achieve because that? People because people, because people are dying left and right. I had eight, had eight murders, murders in my jurisdiction this weekend alone. This weekend alone, eight. I had seven of them. I had seven of them occur within twelve hours of each other. And that just and that just tells, tells, you, the tells, tells you the level of violence it's out there. However, however, this mean all hope is lost. All, all right, because without all right, despair, because without despair, there can be hope. We look through it, find out where the commonality. How can we? How can each other accountable 
So when a deputy, a police officer, comes across a young black man in the street, in the street, how can we make that encounter a positive one? How can we convince young black men, young brown men, young white men, anybody who decides to arm himself with public and get in the conflict with law enforcement? That is where we that have the problems with the shooting, deputy involved shooting, officer involved shooting, and those are the ones that create all the headlines. Those are very true. But that's actually a product of the failures that happen earlier on. Those are the ones that you can get. The headlines are the ones that don't come off. Right. Now, the unarmed ones, you see most of the headlines, they good. So the always wonder, is something they've done to avoid the outcome? The overwhelming majority of the force is hardly. As we saw with the two deputies, there's Compton Pack who was shot in the head. And that's the type of thing. Can we avoid that? Can we avoid people killing each other? And the sheer level, when we had them forced to get about the city, we got to be in South LA. I put a map on the screen. We had 12 homicides in that area alone. We had 163 assaults with a deadly weapon. We had 115 arrests of young men with guns. The ones that were committing all the assaults with a deadly weapon. So we're putting our officers, our deputies out there to try to sort out who who and you know who's the one with the threat to the community and who's the one just trying to go about the daily business. That's a that's a it's not as simple. I think even more fun, who are the ones that are trying to change? A lot of us, a lot of us hate the crime element as much as you do. Now the fact some of them hate it more because we're getting depressed. So at the end of the day, we're police and the community activists change it. We want to change it, but we're not doing that. Well, that's well, that's, well, that's, well, 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 that's the reason why we're that's, that's exactly that's, why we're here today. Exactly so, we're today. so uh, Diane, so, uh, Diane, you're listening in on this great conversation. This great uh, conversation. Do, you uh, do you have a comment? Yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah, I, I think this is great. I had a question, especially. I, I want to thank the law enforcement officers for being so open and sharing, and I also want to thank uh, the man who is being so direct. And um, one of the things. Going back to empathy, is I would ask um, if you guys could share. I, I think what's one of the things that's happening is that I I am not necessarily, and I think I stand for a lot of community members when we don't necessarily see the connection between high crime and why that. Um, leads to behavior that feels oppressive on everyone. And I think if we understood it, because I think that con that connection is somehow being made, I think if we understood it, we might be able to be more empathetic. No, no, I think. And so, and the other thing I think if we if we understood, I, I agree that there are bad apples, and that's not the entire force. But I also think that community members are not only dealing with the brutality and the bad actors, but we're dealing with the system that does not fairly punish bad actors. I would say since we have not run into one officer yet that any um, department didn't already have problems with that officer. Well, and, and, and so I, I think if we could understand how that happens, it would help us to be more empathetic with what I do think the law enforcement community is facing, but I think we don't have that understanding, and because of that, it's hard for us to really connect emotionally and be empathetic in those instances. Exactly, Diane, and the, exactly, the way Diana. that you do the that is through some, some transparency. We're going to get, we're gonna get to the pastor, um, uh, Cedric, and, and uh, Gerard in just a second. But I want to just mention to everybody that on the line, on the call today, we have 25 students from the Los Angeles Unified School District that are paying attention. And right now, when we look at the unrest, rioting, looting, it's mostly our young people that are committing those acts. And so I want to bring in the National Guard. We have General Scott Rice on the line. The, uh, retired director of the N National Guard. And the National Guard is the one that responds and works with law enforcement when civil unrest happens. And I'd just like to have you comment, General Rice, on how 
on how we can do a better job we can, do a better so that, job we can so that prevent civil unrest. What do you say to the young people who are being taught now that, taught that, now that, there's, that, a, that there's, there's a positive, there's a, there's solution, a positive through solution through violence? Through violence. Yeah, and that's, yeah, and that's one that, thing that, uh, 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 we really you know, we really do stress is, is uh, you, know, actions, you know, your actions a lot of times speak louder than words. So, and so, you know, with our youth that are coming into, into the National Guard, we try to stress to them that, uh, you know, we trust you as young members of our force to be representing the values we hold so dear as Americans of, you know, liberty and, and integrity and, you uh, Equal and equal opportunity and, uh, and uh, show you know your show by your actions that, uh, that uh, you know you remove yourself from that and you don't resort to violence even though you might, though you might empathize, empathize and be deeply involved, involved, deeply involved in the cause that is presented in front of you when we put our our soldiers and our airmen out in the street we had tremendous amount of trust in them that they could be calm cool and collected and we put a lot of faith in our leadership that they could you know hold the line and make sure that they represented what's what's right and what's true and not resort to violence or not accept violence or, or oppression or something like that that may be happening right in front of them even though they might be very empathetic to the cause that's there. Over. Thank you. Um, Thank you. So one of the main, uh, so one of the uh, main parts, uh, parts of the community of the is the big community. Is the big and so I would like to ask Pastor, Pastor Sedgwick, like as, 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 as we look at glass half full, half, half, half empty, we talk half about half accountability, we talk about transparency. How can the faith community leaders in the city of Los Angeles help lead the way and show some leadership to help bridge the gap between what the perception is and the reality? That's Sorry for the tough question. Because that's the problem. I think the first thing, I think the first thing and Diana, and Diana, I think she was hitting on something. Which is, which is, which is, which is which you first have to understand, this is a system that has been in place for one of us, where everyone has thought of it, where everyone has thought of it, where everyone has thought of it, where thought of it, where everyone has thought of it. So if we don't come at it from a specific systemic perspective, we will not get to the core of the root cause of the problem. We have to look at it from how we even house and zone into it. You can't group a whole bunch of people into a community and expect for that community to be healthy, wherein when you look at that community, it was zoned based on trying to populate that area by one race of people. Color of law. Good book. Go get it. Color of law. All, of law. Of all about how we zoned our city and put a population, put a population of people in a community. In a community. That's, why to, that's, that's why trying to put in a, in, a, in, a, in a swimming pool and you don't know, think that there's going to eat on each other and two other elk pickers that can't look at it. You can't look at it from that. You got to look at it from the simple fact that there are certain systems that are in it. And until we attack those systems, as faith-based communities and we, we have a tough time because we are usually caught between a rock and a hard place. We're the ones who have, we're the to, ones who have to call out certain systems, but then we're also the ones who have to help those that are oppressed by the system. And get back to the call of the matter is that sometimes from where we sit, it's one of going back to another ethnic experience. My sister here to my right said, protect and serve. Police are, not Police are not supposed to be mental health specialists. Police are not supposed to be domestic violence interventions. Police are not supposed to be counselors. They're supposed to protect and serve. When they're thrown into an instance where they have to Coach Roberts, play out of position, you're going to have you're that going play, to have that play and, a lot, and a lot of times police are playing out of position. We need to get some, need to get some, some, whether, it some whether it is funding, whether it is people who are able to, to do where it, to where when certain calls come in, the police don't have to deal with that. Now, now how do we attack that system? We're not going to deal with We're that, not gonna deal with that that's today. That's that's that has to be taken down by brick by brick by brick and then recreate the other thing that we have to deal with and what we deal with on the faith based community is statistics. 
if there is a if there is a higher occurrence for a police officer that, uh, officer is, that is violent in certain situations, that police officer needs to be the same way as me as a the pastor. Way as me as a pastor, if I'm infecting and the people to and causing folks to be spiritually harmed, I need to get pulled out of the pulpit and not to hurt people. And until we can deal with all of that. We're just going to have these conversations. How not to hurt people. We're never going to have these conversations. And we're never going to get to the root cause of the problem. We can dance around cancer. But until cancer is dealt with aggressively, it's just going to be cancer affected and impacted. And pretty soon, you're going to pass away. We have to understand our cities are passing away. We got to do that. But it's systematic. I think we've heard for that. gloss over. I'm not trying to gloss over any of the bad actors, bad actors because we all don't want bad actors. Hey, you know, police officers hate more than anything a bad officer. The good one takes the bad one because you know what? It turns to our back. People die for this stuff. Okay, we're not going to let anyone punish it. So, but we also we talk about systemic, but we also need leaders like yourself. We need to rise up next. To rise up next. To rise up in the community. Because right now, the loud mouths in the community that don't even live in the community, they're telling you how you should act in your community. We need, we need the people that are in the community that want to sit down and right now to have this dialogue because this is exactly what we need. So we need your voices here. You know, and, and also, and I don't like, I just have a police plug is not reading those uniforms, people. Hey, all these bodies that I've seen in my 27 years. Kids scraped off the street. I wish I could unsee that stuff. I wish I could unsee that stuff. But we can't. And, and that's what we do each and every day. We try to go out there and protect our, our the residents. We will die for someone we don't even know. Every single police officer. Here. We'll, we'll, run we'll, we'll run towards that bullet to protect people you don't even know. And, and I'm not trying to get a pat on the back or anything. I'm just talking about reality. About empathy. These streets. Yeah, they, these streets are, yeah, these streets are, are, are in free. Police officers, though, we have to make sure that we have empathy, compassion, that we don't punish the reputation or the trust of the community. We have to also understand where you're coming from. We have to walk in your shoes and, and, and see how you, per, per, how you oh, see We have us. to also understand where you, how you see that. us. We have to understand that. Because to me, I'm out there, I'm doing my job, I'm taking a service. If you may see me in a uniform, it's just like my brother who just may have someone that was now, got someone that was unarmed. unarmed. Now, armed can become armed unarmed can suspects. And even unarmed suspects can take them off the gun. Just so you guys armed so you suspects. Guys to, so I believe so you guys have to, have to need so I believe the community needs more communication. These body worn videos, I think it's very good. And now the sheriffs have body worn videos. LAPD has body worn videos. We've been having them for years. And it's an open book. We put everything out there. We so we have to have leaders like you guys to rise up in the community um, to be more open and transparent. To okay, so uh, Sheriff Phil Nueva has a, a time okay, period. We're going to keep Sheriff going, but I want to ask you one last question before you have to go. So based on what you've heard today, and, and especially to those who think the glass is half empty, what is it? What is it? Yikes. Um, what is it that you want the, those community people to know, and, and why do you take a different approach? And why do you take a different I want to bring people together. I want to bring the community. I want to bring you. I want to bring people together. I want to bring the community. I want to bring you together. I want to share your perspective and you together. When we see each other, when we come together, we realize, yeah, let's work together. Find a way to keep them. 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 Young generation wanted to want to have to do the provocative things on video on social media. Can we get them to tone it Basically, down? Basically, threaten people. Can we get them to tone it down? Can we get them to respect the authority? Simple thing like that is going to save a lot of lives. Simple thing like that is going to save a lot of lives. Because then the deputies, the officers, the LAPD, trying to sort through these difficult areas of a lot of conflict that you mitigate. It's a mind game. You just don't know what you're coming across. You're coming across as people that are fleeing from danger 
or representatives. And you, they're making sometimes split second decisions that they may regret for the rest of their life. They save their life. That's how uh, precarious the situation is. But if we understand and respect that black lives need to matter, all black lives need to matter, everybody, just like everyone else in life, and we have that understanding. Hey, let's work together. How can we do this? Can we do this? I have a, I have a, I have a, I have faith that we can reach together. We can walk these streets, use our energy, using our energy to bring people together. And rid the scourge of the, the, the gang epidemic, uh, drug epidemic, and finally get away where we have to the people that don't own it. so much of the problems, and they need help. We need to give them the help. Can we get to that place where we have specialization? I don't know if the tax specialization. I don't know if the tax We do have some some financial or fiscal limitations, but we can find a way that we're working better together, by all means. And I want to see the that the we do have some some financial mentality from the dark, from the enforcement mindset of the 80s and 90s, the engagement mindset. We're not the law enforcement agency of 1965. We're not the law enforcement agency of 1965 that saw all those protests and you know I don't know how many dozens of people died. 1992, I'm old enough to have been there, and we lost 63 people in those riots. Thousands of businesses destroyed that never were built again. The vacant lots are still in South Carolina. You go down Fast forward. That is sad. Fast forward to 2020. Not one person died. At least we did not see any serious injury with a majority of the time. There are two others. But if you compare, also, that is progress. We are doing progress because we had tens of thousands of people protesting peacefully on the street. We didn't have that in 1992. We had just a handful of and a lot of them. Now we had a lot of protests, God bless it. That is progress. And very many. Okay, so that, that is progress. We you look back and say, okay, we are improving. Can we do better? Yes. We have to keep pushing ourselves to do better. We have to push the profession. We have to push the community, work together, and we're definitely going to make a difference. Thank you for your perspective. Thank you. Thank you for your perspective. All of you here. For, for uh, this, because this is an important conversation. Correct. Um, thank you very much, yeah. Sheriff, and thank you Correct. for hosting. Uh, and, just so, much, and just so, and just so everyone on the online audience knows, none of the panelists have known each other before. They all kind of worked in their own silos, and this this is an opportunity to bring those silos together and understand the differences. And, and I use the glass half full, half empty as a as a way to to expose the gap. I'm unmuted. Okay, sorry. What I was saying is that uh, no one in this room knew each other. The, the panelists didn't know each other prior to this event. Um, so Bishop Mendez, uh, as, as one of the glass half full, half empty guys, based on what you've heard today from law enforcement, what do you want them to know and how can they take a different approach to make the glass half full? Well, it's just like a marriage. Uh, you, you, have well, it's not a marriage. you can't just uh, you have to look at it. use the same strategies over and over. Use the same strategy over and over. Got to be communication. Got to be communication. Got to be state. And uh, I know that during this uh, period of time, I know that during this period of time, the public really impacted our very way, whatever dialogue we had prior to uh, COVID, but stop completely. We shouldn't have had the dialogue. We shouldn't have had the conversation. The dialogue. The dialogue. The dialogue. The dialogue. And so I would ask, so would ask the, the, the chairman and Leva, the chairman and Leva, bring them back to the table. Uh, because, because during this time, uh, we have not been at that. We have been on the table at that. Well, that's why the voice project is here. We bring everybody to the table. You bringing us with with our friends at Rise. And and also, you know, I I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I think we need to. I think we need to. The plans are not. 
Well, well, we're talking. We're, we're thinking through their right. Also, also, this is about transparency. This is about transparency and accountability. The community law enforcement. The community law enforcement. It's not a one-way street. It's not a one-way street. We know that the churches. I we know that the churches also we need to do whatever we need to do because the rhetoric be only about love cannot be only about love and enjoy. It's got to be about us holding our members responsible also. There is three here that are members of the There's pastors and there's as leaders in our religious community. We need to adapt to this. We need to bring our young people in and all the things that they need in a straight way. We can't just be a one-way um, sorry, okay. in the interest of time, oh, interest of those time, of us that are here um, live, we're going to continue on. Uh, but before we go, I would like to bring in Dave Roberts one more time, because I know he has to go. Um, Dave, based on what you've heard today and how we want to try to get to the glass half full, in your experience as a manager, uh, what, what, can you, what advice can you give to the police and the community to help bridge that gap? Yeah, uh, um, this was uh, gold. Uh, it really was. Um, I, I didn't know really what to expect. Uh, in on this call and vulnerable and open. It's not easy. And uh, I know we all appreciate that. Um, I think for me, it's a situation where I look at the Dodgers and I look at it as a former athlete it's a, and as a community member. It's almost like uh, the police department, sheriff department um, needs a new rebranding. And, um, you know, people spend a lot of money on perception to make a reality. And I, I just believe that, you know, you look at the gentleman who was speaking uh, pretty honestly about his feeling about the police department and for the police department to not have the backing of citizens who who do abide by the law um, is a problem and, and so i think that i recall um you know csm clark uh, diane so many people had so many great things to say and um i do believe that it is systemic i also feel that the rebranding part of it is getting the police officers in schools and, and impacting these young kids because young kids of color do see the police officers now as a threat. And um, I, I mean, that's more of the solution. It's the leadership. And I think that it seems like for me and, and as a community member that the police department, the sheriff's department is really on the defensive and not acting proactively. Um, and then you feel kind of threatened. Um, as a community member again, and I don't know what's behind the curtain. I get criticized every single day in my job, <laughs> and I don't know, and people don't know what's going on and what leads to decisions and all this kind of stuff. So I can't even speak to the to what's going on behind uh, these departments. But I do know that when you're here to protect and serve the citizens, and what's right is. to be held to a certain standard on uh, own and that's kind of the perception that we as citizens feel instead of right is right wrong is wrong and if you don't do it right you'll be disciplined um, and that's what makes me or the gentleman i was speaking to you feel uncomfortable and you don't feel confident in the system um but again i applaud everyone for being here and listening um i get a lot of criticism a lot of advice so uh, for me to listen for the last hour and a half, it's been huge for me, and I think I've grown. And uh, I, I just wish we could take some of these snippets of these conversations and put them into the middle schools, into the high schools, since we are virtual these days. This is really something that's really tangible, I think, for these teens that they can learn from to see both sides and every side of what adult conversations are like. Um, so that's for me as far as solutions on looking out on what we can do. But I do feel that the social media, media rebranding of the police forces. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Dave. And uh, you, Dave. I, I hope that you'll be part of this going forward. Uh, I know that we definitely, on the rise side, the education point and, and, and getting that, the kids educated. And we, we do have plans to take some of this great content and, and move that along. So that'll be one of our after action so steps. And then, and then also, um, you know, getting this group together uh, again and, and, and bringing more people to the group. As someone mentioned, the CHP uh, didn't participate in this. And there's some other folks that I invited that didn't participate, but I think we're gonna generate some momentum now because everyone was a little afraid maybe of what this was gonna be like, but, but they don't understand the military mind suit is can do, get things done, and let's win the hearts and minds. So thank you very much for, for being with us. For those of you guys online, we're going to continue on. Uh, you can stay on if you want or, or drop off. It's up to you. We, we, we'd certainly like to see you guys stay on if you have the time. So let's go back. Uh, is is uh, Deputy Chief Arcos, are you still with us? I'm not sure if he if he dropped off. So we have with us today Jesse Valles. So we he is uh, recently awarded the George MacArthur is. Leadership Award. He is one of 29 uh, U.S. Army uh, junior officers to receive that award out of more than 120,000. If you could, please talk to us a little bit. Uh, obviously, somebody somewhere saw something in you about leadership. And, and talk to both uh, the community folks and, and the law enforcement folks about how you see military leadership and how that can translate into the civilian community. Thank you for having me, first of all, John. And, uh, I'll speak Thank you for to having me on the onset of the Army Valley. I'll speak to this on the onset of the Army Valley. We have given a lot of training. And I just feel like we that along the way to do the best I could for not myself, but the service portion of the all the service of the community, all the service that took a long opportunity I had an opportunity to do the community engagement back in the California fire and change from completely into that to learn. And uh, I don't know if Dave Roberts dropped off already or not, um, but uh, Jesse is a huge Dodger fan and has his own Dodger tattoo, Dodger. just so you know. Just so you know. Um, um, is there anyone else in the in the community here that would like to uh, ask a question or address a question to one of the community members or one of the law enforcement members? Okay. Colonel Hensley, would you like to talk a little bit about the ROTC? If a recruiter comes to the school, they have to be invited and they have to be escorted from one location to the other. The question I have to the panel 
the question I have is now, with these three ROPC cadets, with these three ROPC cadets, doing service going to try to get the briefing out to the community. Do you see the class half full or half at school with our LA Unified schools because of these three ROPC cadets? Cedric? Yes, sir. 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 Yes, um, uh, oh, well, I'm like, I'm like Bishop here. I, I, grew, Bishop up here. I, I grew up in LA. Well, I'm an LA guy. I went to LAUSD. My students went to LAUSD. Um, ROTC was always around. ROTC, some of, some of my friends who are police officers, sheriff, LAPD, I got some friends that are detectives. They came through the ROTC program. Um, I think it's a valuable program because you got to realize with education, every kid is not a four-year university uh, student. Uh, uh, there are some students. Uh, there are some students that need junior college. There are some students that need trade school. There are some students that do need the military uh, and do need ROTC uh, because, I, because I, I, that's it, it's more of an option. Uh, when, when, when you have students that are are coming up through LAUSD, sometimes it's it's it's, it's great to have those types of folks on campus. I think ROTC and having that on campus is much better than having police on campus. Uh, and those are those are two different ends of the spectrum. Uh, but I think you can get the same. You probably get something better. If you do have those on campus that are, are ROTC, uh, leadership, mentorship, uh, and those that are in as students who are in ROTC, because I think you may have a campus that's a little bit better and has a little bit better uh, structure and community and feel to it. Well, no, and that's the mentorship well, no, program that's the that we hope to start that we with the faith start, community uh, here in Los Angeles with the ROTC kids. And we, we actually tried to do something for them all, but we have a little issue, and we're going to delay that we're start. But, delay that start, uh, but uh, I think there's a great opportunity with that, opportunity that, with that we can go. That, that's that part of this. As we look to the future and have these future discussions, we can have different ramps of, of programming um, for different games, different, different, different graphics, you know, when we look at how do we attack games, how do we improve that part of it, how do we improve youth so that they don't join the games, and how can we use programs like the Junior ROTC to help mentor kids at their schools or in their community, and, and then how does that intertwine with um, police officers when you're using the police league or the, 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 the faith community with Bishop Mendez and his group, does that, does that sort of make sense? Does that sort of make sense to people? Yes. Is, is there anyone else online is, is that has a question before we sign off? Yeah, there's one of the cadets yeah, there's that, there's that, there's that, there's that, that, let's see here. Arturo. 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 My favorite cadet. My favorite cadet. Arturo, are you there? Arturo, are you there? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. yourself. So talk a little bit from your perspective. From your perspective. What the do you police, want the police and the police unions? What do you want them to know what about what it's like to be a, a youth like in to be LA right now? In LA right now. Well, I'm not sure I'd have very valuable um, point of view from my position, but I would like to say that I appreciate a lot of what's happening, and I think there should be more equal engagement from both sides of the argument on what is being done by departments, police departments, and by minorities that feel uh, affected, rightfully so too, rightfully so. Yeah, I just think it's very, I just think it'd be more constructive to show a more human side to the police department as well as, um, the legitimate, the legitimate, the legitimate and on concerns of many people. Many people. I, would just I would just hope that, that there isn't any, there isn't any distrust that's being um, created between any communities. I think it would be 
I think it would be equally destructive to promote a narrative that says that a police department or a system is inherently bad. I think that would be very, you know, counterproductive. That's it for me. Thank you, Arturo. Are there any other cadets that would like to say anything before we sign off? Or anybody in the audience? Uh, Michael Haynes? Michael Haynes. Are you still there? Are you still there? All right, with that, All right, with uh, that, I'd like to thank everybody. Uh, I'd, like I'd like to thank everybody. I'd like to thank Josh for a great exercise for a great on exercise empathy on and how we can uh, use empathy to help build, uh, empathy to help build uh, bridges. Uh, I'd, like bridges. Like I'd like to thank all the guests online. I'd like to thank online. everybody like here, especially all the veterans. Uh, happy Veterans Day to all the veterans out there, especially those participating in our life. I'd like to thank the community members and, and for your honesty and candidness. I, I think it's very good. I thought the, the glass half full, half empty scenario really helps expose the gap. I think it's really important for both sides to hear that so that they recognize that there is a gap. And uh, thanks to all the media people uh, for being on and help spread the word so we can keep this dialogue going. Uh, there are more voices that we can add to this as we go forward. And, and I would like to try to you know, have these uh, discussions. Uh, I thank you, Bishop Mendes, for offering your church as a potential location going forward um, so we can have uh, the ability to get together. And I, I'd like to try to see us try to do it one more time before Christmas or maybe uh, you know, we'll have a, a Christmas version where everyone will be jolly and happy and merry and we'll get going forward. So thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it. And uh, happy Veterans Day to all our veterans. And uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.